Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me this evening and welcome to Basic Nation Analysis Lanka. Now, this is, I think, going to be a bit of an interesting one. Um, you may see here, my test expansion here was done actually on a pretty shitty map. I generated this map uh, hastily without looking at the parameters and didn't notice until too late that it wasn't actually wraparound. So I ended up in a corner surrounded by water and ur, which forced me into an early war with AI ur. Despite that, Right now I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 provinces on turn 12, two forts built, one upgraded next turn. Uh, pretty okay income. This is a decent start. Um, if Ur hadn't been here, let's pretend Ur had fucked off somewhere else, um, or if there had been less water or something, or if this had been a fully wraparound map and I could have like gone somewhere and done something, um, I would probably have 18 or 20 provinces um, and wouldn't be at war with anyone. Although this war is uh, not a terrible idea. But in any case, um, Lanka is a nation that is... It's been somewhat heavily nerfed, actually, in Dominions 5. In Dominions 4, it was quite overpowering because of a combination of traits that was highly, highly effective. The first, uh, very, very good blood access. Raktapatas are 80 gold. They are blood 1 priest mages, so half upkeep as well as uh, decent blood hunting potential. And, of course, uh, Lanka has two special things about blood. First of all, they have a bonus in turmoil. They get extra blood slaves in turmoil from the hunts. And secondly, um, they have a series of very, very effective national blood summons, starting with the Rakshasas, which are merely okay, going down to Asrapas, which are very, very good, um, Santiabalas, which are specialized but pretty decent, and Dakini, which are fantastic cloud trap using air slash blood assassin thug teleporting support mage everything Dakini do everything all the way up to mandehas who are high level extremely powerful uh super combatants and danavas which are troops that you can uh gift of reason to make them into powerful thugs or anti-thugs as well so um i've actually already started blood hunting to a pretty significant extent. I've got three blood hunters here, and then I've got two people reanimating soulless. Because the other quality that Lanka has that in Dominions 4 made them pretty overpowered was the fact that they have uh, national reanimation. Now, the way this worked changed between Dominions 4 and Dominions 5. In Dominions 4, national uh, reanimation was a national trait, which meant that any independent priest could do it. And you could recruit an independent priest just by building a temple and starting to churn them out. They were one command point. So, as Lanka, you could build up a stable of independent priests and basically go full Ermor, where your independent priests are reanimating long dead every single turn, and you build up an army of, like, a thousand long dead very quickly. In Dominions 5, it is a unit trait. It is a unit trait that your national priests have. However, all your national priests are also mages, which means that they require two command points to recruit, and they must be recruited from a fort. They cannot be recruited from an unforted temple, which slows things down. Also, you need a temple and a lab to recruit them now. So, yeah, much, much slower. Um, and, of course, your efficient reanimators are also your efficient blood hunters. So, Lanka kind of has to pick whether they want reanimation or blood hunting. In this case, I'm picking a mix of both because I can then use the soulless that I reanimate as uh, patrollers. So, I don't have to pay units to do that. Um, and I have undead leadership on both my Yoginis, my Kalamukas, and, of course, the Raktapadas themselves. At this point, I have not recruited any mage except Raktapadas. I've recruited only Raktapadas. I haven't even recruited Raktapadas every turn. Um, and that's because I also use Raktapadas for expansion. Raktapadas lead Lanka's recruitable sacreds in expansion, mainly the Palankashas. Uh, Palankashas are pretty decent. They have weaknesses, specifically low prot, so they're pretty easy to kill. Um, but overall, they're very sturdy, and they hit like trucks, because they have high hit points, high attack skill, and high damage. They also have chaos power, which gives them bonus attack and strength and defense in Turmoil. So this is another reason why, as Lanka, you always want to take Turmoil 3. Um, Turmoil 3 is worse in Dominions 5 than it was in Dominions 4. That was another way in which Lanka ended up nerfed. Um, but still, it's it's very valuable. Now, this army is actually probably going to attack my Blood Hunters. So I think I'm actually going to need to fall back to my fort real quick here. But I'm not going to run another turn of this game at the moment, so that's sort of, just strategically speaking, I want to do that to avoid having all these people killed, because this is like more than half my mage core at this point. Um, what I'm doing here is just gathering up some random troops to fight uh, Ur with, but uh, basically my expansion's been pretty decent despite being forced by terrain into an unfortunate early war and uh, being blocked off by water. 
Um, now, part of that has is that I took an Awake Expander. Uh, Lanka does have a couple of Awake Expander options. They don't have great options. We'll talk about that in more detail. But suffice it to say, I think probably the Man Eater is the most efficient option for Lanka in that it gives you decent expansion, which otherwise Lanka can struggle with, as well as the scales you want, and a minor Bless, which is effective for your summons, albeit not super effective for your recruitable sacreds. Um, your recruitable sacreds just kind of have to go by the wayside. Like I said, they're solid units stat-wise, but they're very expensive. They cost 55 gold, and um, yeah, it's not great. Uh, in hindsight, I wouldn't have taken production 3. I would have probably taken production 2 or 1, and used those points to take some magic scales, or perhaps some more, a couple more paths for a slightly higher level bless. Albeit, I think this bless functions. The bless that I took is Fire Shock Resistance and Blood Surge. And the reason I took that, specifically, is that Lonkin Demon Sacreds, except for the recruitable ones, the Asara, Anusara, and Palankasha, all share a specific weakness, which is weakness to fire. Uh, except for there's a couple of them that aren't monkey-shaped that don't have that weakness, but the Rakshasa, all those summons, they all are weak to fire, and stopping that weakness to fire from affecting you is one, I think, relatively important thing for Lanka to do, especially because your high-level summonable commanders and your recruitable commanders are also susceptible to fire. Basically, if it's a demon, odds are it's susceptible to fire. Um, in terms of recruitables, then, let's talk about those first real quick. Lanka has the usual lineup of scout uh, and troops, including Bandarajas, which are a 120 leadership commander. Um, all of their normal units are animals, so they are susceptible to animal attacking spells, and have low magic resistance, low like Ulm level low, or even slightly lower. This can be a problem in the late game. High level nature mages can steal huge numbers of your monkey troops from you, which is one reason why as Lanka you don't want to rely on monkey units uh, for long. Roctopatas, likewise, Blood One Mages. They are animals, they have decent magic resistance, but not as high as most other mages. Yoginis, pretty solid mages, actually. They can use blood to form Sabbaths, they have death and nature. Um, overall, quite good. Kalamukas, a little bit expensive for what they do. They are blood with one random, so they're worse mages than Yoginis. They are Holy Two and Reanimator Priests. Overall, I'm not sure, like, the only reason I would recruit a Kalamuka over a Rattapata is for more efficient reanimation, but I don't think the level 2 priest reanimation is that much more efficient than the level 1 reanimation, and they're going to cost you more upkeep. It's 68 per year versus 32 per year, so I'd rather just recruit two Rattapatas for less upfront and less upkeep. Then you get into your two capital-only mages. The interesting thing about them is that the stronger one is actually not slow to recruit. So the Rakshasi, or, well... Not always stronger, but we'll talk about that in a second. The Rakshasi has all of your national magical paths, plus 200% randoms in all of those national paths, which includes air and death. Uh, air and death are both great paths, and they taste great together. Um, they're fantastic in combination, they're fantastic alone. Overall, very, very strong. This is the combo that makes Fomoria an extremely powerful nation. Uh, as Lanka, you have more limited access to it because you don't have recruitable A2 giant mages in every fort and your air death mages aren't inherently as powerful as Nimedian sorceresses. But Rakshasi are still quite strong, especially because they can form Sabbaths. So you can use Sabbaths to drop all the same high-level air and death spells that Fomoria does in the late game. Uh, earlier than that, you can use Storm to, to cause missiles to be problematic, which is good for you because your troops hate wearing hats. Um, you can lay down uh, battlefield-wide buffs like uh, Bloodlust, Wooden War uh, sorry, Mass Protection, that kind of thing. Uh, and you can cast, of course, Shadow Blast and Horde of Skeletons, the basic death spells. However, Rakshasi are slow to recruit, so you probably won't have as many of them, oddly, as you will of Rakshorajas. Rakshorajas are Blood 2, Air 2, and they have one random of Air, Death, or Blood. They don't get Nature, except as a 2.5% random. But stat-wise, they're quite good, actually. They do have the Chaos Power. Uh, they are susceptible to Fire, like all other of the uh, Longan Demons are. But the cool thing about Rakshirajas is that they're not slow to recruit, and they can easily random Air 3, Blood 3, or Death 2. I mean, that's that's the neat thing about them. They get slightly higher level paths than the Rakshara, Rakshirasi, Rakshasi. So Rakshiraja overall, I think, are the better mage, uh, especially because they are recruitable one per turn. So once you get some income, you can start churning Rakshirajas out and actually have valuable numbers of them in your armies. Um, they are thuggable, if you want to thug them, 
and I think that's a reasonable use of them. Uh, you don't have access to earth forging, which makes it a little bit more difficult, but they come with okay armor, plus they have decent nat prot. Um, and if you take a fire resistance bless, which you probably should on Lanka, then you can counteract that weakness, turn it into fire resistance 5, which is okay to be getting on with. Um, they can cast mist form, they can cloud trap ease, so they can raid pretty effectively. Um, and they have blood magic, and blood magic allows them to do things like cast reinvigoration or cast uh, damage uh, reversal on themselves in the late game. Plus they have death, which can you, you can use to drop some uh, invulnerability on them with the Stygian skin spell. Things like that. So they have various things that they can do. That said, they're not ideal thugs, and I probably wouldn't thug them often. Like, raiding with them may be okay, sure. They're not slow to recruit, so they are somewhat replaceable. But generally, I would have these guys with my army to cast Storm, to summon air elementals, um, or to cast high-level blood spells very easily. In terms of troops, your troop lineup sucks, generally speaking. Every unit from here left is just garbage. Uh, light band or archers have no prop. They do have longbows, which is unusual in the early age, but they're kind of expensive. And for archers, you really want to be able to mass them up. Also, their precision is not high. Bandar are not very accurate. Atavi archers, slightly more accurate, but extremely cowardly, as well as low magic resistance. No prot and short bows. They are very cheap, so you can cast Wind Guide, like any Raksharaja can cast Wind Guide just by himself, which can help your archers, and massing up huge numbers of Atavi archers or Light Bandar archers and casting Wind Guide on them could be a, a moderately effective early game strategy, but overall I'm not too impressed with the idea. Uh, Atavi infantry are bad. They are militia, um, except with lower magic resistance. They are stealthy, so you can raid with them to some extent, and they're super, super cheap and recruitable in any forest. So you can see over here, I am, as I mentioned, recruiting a bunch of Atavi archers to use against Ur's troops because Ur is using the troops with no armor because they are the AI and not smart. Uh, so Atavi archers will do okay against these guys. They'll do chip damage. Uh, but overall, not great. Bandar warriors are decent. They're not fantastic. They're not amazing. They're slightly better than indie troops. Um, the main value that you get for them is that they hit very hard. They do 21 bludgeoning damage. Unfortunately, they don't wear helmets, like Ur's uh, Enkidu troops, so that makes them vulnerable. And their overall prot is not high because they're wearing this scale mail cuirass, which is a fairly low prot piece of, arm piece of armor. They do have high hit points, and as I said, they have high damage. Uh, they also have this sticks and stones ranged attack, and this is honestly, in my opinion, one of their strongest suits. The fact that this has two attacks, so they can throw at two squares per turn. It's not accurate, but it's also not long range, so that's okay. And it does 12 bludgeoning damage, which is actually pretty high damage for a missile. En masse, Bandar warriors can inflict pretty significant damage by throwing their missiles, especially because they have 30 ammunition, so anyone who's not in melee will tend to keep throwing missiles for a long, long time, unless you've specifically given them attack orders. Um, so having some groups of Bandar on attack orders and other groups behind them throwing missiles is, I think, a perfectly valid strategy. You will get some friendly fire, but especially if you drop Wind Guide, Bandar Warriors can kind of do it all. They can serve as ad hoc archers with fairly high damage, and they can serve as your mainline infantry. Once you get up to Fog Warriors, Bandar Warriors become extremely tough. Uh, Kalamuka Warriors are your first recruitable sacred, and they are basically Palankasha Light. They are slightly worse than Palankasha in most ways, but they do wear hats if you need head prot, and they cost 5 less gold. Uh, Asara are naked sacreds, which automatically makes me dislike them because they're high investment, 35 gold and low defense. They have lots of hit points, very low prot. Um, they do have javelins, which is kind of nice at high damage, and they have high damage spears. So length three, you can do some repel shenanigans with these guys because they have long weapons. Uh, Anusara have less hit points, but very high combat speed. These are effectively sacred light cavalry. Um, they can run around the flanks. They only have one attack, however, and they're size three. So overall unimpressive. I wouldn't really bother with them. Palankachas are kind of the staples of early Lankan expansion. Uh, they have some armor, high hit points, high strength, good stats overall. They're expensive, they cost 55 gold. Um, but they also have Chaos Power, which makes them interesting because as long as you spread your scales, the Palankasha actually perform a lot better than you would think from looking at their base stats. This is a Palankasha under Turmoil 3. He hits for 30 damage, has attack skill 16, defense skill 15. That goes a long way towards protecting these guys. Against independent troops, as long as you can get even Turmoil 1 or 2 in the province, Palankasha will put in work. However, the main draw of Lanka is not the Palankasha, it is the summons. 
I've actually already gone over the Lonkin Summons. In my National Blood Summons video, I spent quite a bit of time talking about the Lonkin Summons and what they're good for and why they're good. Um, I won't replicate all of that business here, but basically I'll say, uh, watch that video if you're interested in that. I, I really would recommend it. I don't want to toot my own horn too much, but I think I did a pretty okay job covering their strengths and weaknesses. Um, overall, the interesting thing there is that Lanka actually has a couple of different blessed priorities and kind of has to pick one. If you want really good early expansion, Lanka can take a durability bless for Palankashas, which is easy. Palankashas want regeneration and blood bond. And if they have regeneration and blood bond, everything else kind of pfft, like secondary. Um, regen blood bond means they're regenerating, they're spreading their damage out. They already have okay prot and high hit points, especially against early age independence. That will mean that like six to eight Palankasha can take most early age provinces with no casualties. You do need an awake god to do that. An awake immobile would work perfectly well for that. And you could expand with Palankasha probably without too, too much trouble. However, um... That does still leave you somewhat vulnerable to either unlucky indies, like Lance Strikes will still fuck your Palankasha up, or um, people who are prepared to take advantage of the weakness this leaves on your Sacreds, which is fire vulnerability. Your Summons will still be vulnerable to fire, and your Raksha Rajas and Rakshasi will still be vulnerable to fire. That's a serious weakness, especially later in the game. Um, if someone can cast one fire elemental and fuck over huge numbers of your summoned sacreds or your summoned thugs or whatever, that can be a problem. Um, your uh, Rakshasa warriors are vulnerable to fire, your Danavas are vulnerable to fire, your... what's the name of them? Your uh, uh, Mandehas are vulnerable to fire. I don't think Dakini are vulnerable to fire. They're not, because they're, uh, they're not ape sacreds. But still, having all those rest, the rest there vulnerable to fire is a problem. Um, Dakini and Asrapas are not. But Rakshasa, Rakshasa Warriors, Prakasas, Santyabalas, Samanishadas, Mandeha, and Danavas are all vulnerable to fire. As well as, of course, your recruitable mages, which is bad. Because, like, if somebody casts Firestorm on this and this guy's on the field, he gonna die. Like, I don't care what his bless is, he's going to die if he's susceptible to fire 5. Because he'll be taking, uh... 11 armor piercing damage no yes 11 armor piercing damage every time the firestorm hits him and it will light him on fire and he'll burn to death so bad especially because double because one of your main combat strategies in the early mid game is casting wooden warriors which makes people vulnerable to fire so if you have sacreds that are already vulnerable to fire and you cast bark skin on them now you're in serious trouble so you really 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 want fire resistance which is not an early expansion bless it doesn't really help Palankasha's fight things. But if you're taking minor blesses including fire resistance, then you can easily construct a bless that helps Asrapas. Asrapas have life draining attacks. They don't have a lot of armor. They have okay hit points, but not a huge amount of hit points. What they do have are good base stats and life drain plus multiple attacks. They have two attacks each, one of which is the life draining Athame. Um, so the bless that they really want is strength and attack skill and fire resistance, which you want for your other your other things so that you can cast bark skin on them if you take that bless then palankashas are not perfect for expansion um which makes you want to take an awake expander and that's where the man eater comes into play i've named him the monkey king just because it's lanka he's the king of the monkeys whatever but the man eater lets you take uh fire shock resist and blood surge really really cheap and blood surge is a great bless for us rapas because they will tend to kill someone when they attack early and then they'll get that big boost to strength and attack skill um, and that will help them kill people more easily. It's also a decent bless for all your other sacreds. Like, Blood Surge on a Palankasha puts, pushes him up to strength 25 under, uh, when he's under, uh, I'm almost saying Chaos, Turmoil 3, uh, which puts his damage up into the scary range. Also, Attack Skill 19. Attack Skill 19 on Palankashas is really nice. Um, Rakshasa and Rakshasa Warriors similarly. There's the Rakshasa Warriors have the two-handed Iron Cudgel, so they do tremendous damage. And the attack plus attack skill from Blood Surge is very welcome for them. So, personally, I think that's probably the way to go, is a Wake Expander with a Minor Bless designed mainly for Asrapas and Summons, not for Palankasha. As you can see, my expansion is still quite decent. Uh, the Monkey King here can, with a little bit of care, expand into most provinces. You have to set him to attack rear, but he can do that because he flies. And um, Prot 19 is enough. 
It's not a huge amount. You can't run him alone into barbarian provinces or heavy cav provinces. But combined with his basically high stats and multiple attacks, uh, it is enough. Um, also, Flick Barbs has gets three attacks, which is kind of cool. So 19 prot, 170 hit points, good attack and defense skill. Uh, the Monkey King can expand into most, can pick off vulnerable targets and can hop around to choose those vulnerable targets, plus hop back to join up with your main expansion parties of Sacreds when necessary. You'll be leading your Palankashas with Raktapatas. Um, I would still profitize your main commander, even though he can't lead undead, um, because that lets him kind of wander around supporting and lets him cast Divine Blessing in combination with a Raktapata. Uh, other strategy, you could just leave him unprofited and profit your first Raktapata instead to let him lead uh, Sacreds and cast Divine Blessing on them. Your Raktapata will be performing a lot of duty during the game. You'll want to be recruiting at least some of them pretty much every turn forever, and I don't, I can't really think of an exception for that. Um, you will want uh, Yoginis to do your actual research. Taking magic skills is probably a decent idea in order to boost your research, because otherwise your research is god-awful, because Raktapatas are not sitting around researching. They are out blood hunting, or leading armies, or reanimating the undead. They have tons of things to do that aren't research. Um, so your research is going to come off the backs of your Yuginis. Um, at least not taking Drain, I think, is probably a decent idea. There is, of course, the Hellblast strategy for Lanka. They have a ton of Sacreds, including Summonable Sacreds. If you tank your scales really bad, you can, in fact, afford just a monstrous, crazy bless for them. And that's doable. If you take a, a Hellbless for uh, Lankan Sacreds, they could be quite scary. Uh, I don't personally like Hellbless strategies aren't my favorite. Let's uh, quit out of this real quick so we can take a look at Pretender Gods. But they're definitely doable, and I won't say I won't say much against them because, like, yeah, that's actually one of the traditional strategies for Lanka. So let's say, I don't know why Lanka doesn't get the Great Black Bull. The Great White Bull is Earth Nature, the Great Black Bull is Blood Nature. That would be perfect for Lanka, but Lanka doesn't get it. But if you're taking the Maneater, and if you take Drain, Misfortune, Turmoil, and Sloth, then you can afford to take him awake with, like, you can even put afford to put nature on him. Uh, I'm minus one. Oh, I'm minus one point. Oh, that blows. Oh, there. Take my uh, my heat three. So now I can afford to take fire shock resist, regeneration, and uh, blood bond. Actually, I'm even one point over. I don't need that point there. So ha, I can I can afford to take only drain two. <laughs> the power, the unlimited power. Um, I think this is probably. Like, I would think this would backfire on you at some point, but you've got Growth 3 and you've got Turmoil 3, which is kind of what Lanka wants out of scales. Everything else can be sort of worked around. You'll have a hard time recruiting a lot of Palankasha because of Sloth, so actually I would probably cut that down and go that way instead, so that you could have some resources. Uh, Palankasha do require some resources, 17, and Kalamuka Warriors require set 20. Um, your income's gonna be shit per province like this, but if you take Fire Shock Resist Regen Blood Bond, I think your Palankasha can probably expand through most things without really stopping. Um, or you could take, uh, a Raksharani instead, and just actually take Fire, plus 7 and 5, that leaves you 200 points. So now I can take Major Fire Resist... Regeneration, Blood Bond. I still have 200 points. Kick that up to 6. I still have 185 points. Okay, now I take... Uh, yeah, let's say now I take uh, Death, so that I can take uh, a couple points of Undead Command for my commanders, and a couple points of Undying. Uh, I can go up to Fire, so I have a plus attack skill. What else do I do with the rest of my points? Uh, I probably take 0 Productivity. Or maybe I take uh, 7 Dominion. 7 Dominion wouldn't be a bad idea, just to spread my sloth as quickly as possible. This bless would make your your dudes very, very scary. Or, instead of Blood Bond, you could kill Blood Bond, uh, take, a, take that point, go up to Blood 6, and get uh, 2 times Strength of the Flesh. Now this is a bless for everybody. You have Regeneration for your Palankashas, you have Strength, you have Attack Skill, you have Undying, so your guys stick around a little bit longer, and with the Undying Regen combo, they will actually regenerate out of death if they go into negative 4 hit points. That's pretty solid. 
Um, in fact, I would probably just take away un Undead Command and go four times Undyne. This would be a strategy. This would be a, a hellacious Palankasha expansion segueing straight into hellacious Asrapa fighting in the mid game. Your expansion might be a little bit slowed because you don't technically have an Awake Expander, but I think with this Bless, probably one turn's recruitment of Palankasha can take most independent provinces, so something like this could definitely be tried. Um, your other good Awake Expansion option is the Worm. Unfortunately, the Worm is Earth and Water cross path, so you don't really need water as a Bless path. Earth, good. Water, eh, not necessarily. Um, he regenerates naturally and is amphibious, plus has fear, so the Worm can actually expand right out of the box as long as you give him at least Earth 4, like the Maneater can. Um, overall, I would say for Lanka, either the Raksharani or the Maneater is probably the, the choice there. Actually, I think... Uh, the Fountain of Blood might get you the Bless slightly cheaper, because if we take the Raksharani, it's... because it's Death 4, 7, 6, and 6, right? And then 6 Dominion. I think the Fountain of Blood gets it for you a little bit cheaper. Could be wrong, but I think so. Uh, no, I'm wrong. The Raksharani gets it cheaper. That was my... my first instinct was correct. Okay, so yeah, Raksharani, Maneater... Uh, Great White Bull is a decent generic expander. If you take the Great White Bull, then you're locked into taking, basically, a regen Fire Shock Resist Bless. And that's real basic. That'll give you some scales, along with a decent Awake Expander. So you can take, like, you don't have to take Drain. You can take only Misfortune 2 and have a point of productivity to help with your recruiting sacreds. So you could do that. That wouldn't be bad. Then, then it's Fire Shock Resist and Regeneration is the Bless there. Um, overall, I think Maneater or Raksharani are still my choices, but in, in either case, uh, what you're not going to do is play Scales Lanka, generally speaking. You could play Scales Lanka, you could play an Imprisoned, like, Imprisoned Fountain of Blood, and you could do this kind of thing, where you've got, uh, no, no negative luck, you've got Magic 3, you've got Productivity 3, so your income is actually positive, you've got pretty high Dominion, you can take Major Fire Resistance... Strength of the Flesh, if we're taking... Because we're taking non-incarnates here. Uh, and then you can take, like, Strength of the Earth or something. I would probably... I'd probably go Strength of the Flesh, Fire 6, and Earth 4. And then the Fire 6 will go to Major Fire Resist, Attack Skill, and another Strength. So this gives you plus 6 Strength, which is huge for us Rapas, And pretty good for your, your other Sacreds. As well as plus Attack Skill... Gives you some fire resistance, and then you can, I guess, you can take Mountain Survival. Um, that would be an okay Imprisoned Lanka. I think your early expansion would struggle, because you don't really have any defensive bless, so your Palankasha will die. But, you've got really good scales, and you can do a lot of damage once you get going. So this is another, this is another possibility. Okay, if you wanted to play Imprisoned Lanka, this is probably something like the direction I would go in. Um, you could also try it with a Freak Lord if you wanted a wider rainbow, because his path, clock, path cost is lower. But I don't think a wider rainbow would necessarily help you much. Um, you could get Swiftness out of air, which would be pretty solid. Um, and potentially Magic Resistance. Magic Resistance is another bless that you could possibly like. But in any case, there's a lot of ways to play Lanka. They're not as strong as they were in Dominions 4, but I think they're still quite a solid faction. A solid nation. And the thing to keep in mind is just Lanka is really about the sacreds. Um, the reanimation is really more niche now than it used to be. The main important strategy I see with it is using some uh, Raktapadas to reanimate the soulless, reanimate soulless out of the corpses that you create by heavily blood hunting provinces. You are, as Lanka, going to blood hunt provinces to the fucking ground. You're just going to raise them. You're going to turn everybody into undead and blood slaves and move on to the next. Don't be afraid to do that. Just burn your provinces, salt the earth, convert everyone into demons, and uh, and move on. And that kind of playstyle does encourage the Hellscales thing, like I'll be real. Uh, what if you went imprisoned Hellscales? If you went imprisoned Hellscales, you could afford, like, some Bless up in here. You could... You could afford some Bless. Take, like, Swiftness... Shock resist. Uh, withering weapons. Undying. Actually, I'd probably, like, to be honest, I'd probably just take undying. 
like four points of undying. I probably wouldn't take any higher than death four. Don't really need it. Take some undying. Take some... Let's go magic weapons, I think, and then magic resistance. I'd want astral seven. So what would I cut for that? I would probably cut my swiftness and take uh, Precision for Sacred Weapons, for Sacred Mages, because you have a bunch of Sacred Mages. So take a couple Precision for that, and then take ma Magic Weapons, Major Magic Resistance. This this is like a, a, an Imprisoned Rainbow Hellblast. I have no idea if this is a good idea. This is just something I was looking at for fun. But if I was creating a Rainbow Imprisoned Hellblast, this is what I would do. Plus eight Strength, plus eight X, uh, HP from the Undying, essentially. Fire resistance, shock resistance, magic weapons, magic resistance, and attack skill. That would make your guys pretty fucking scary. In any case, uh, thanks for watching. Hopefully this has given you some ideas about Lanka. Uh, as I've mentioned before, I am playing Lanka in Accidental Ascension 4. Unfortunately, I don't really have any of this. If we look at creating gods, I've looked at this guy before. This is DMX, the Master Lich, who is my god in Accidental Ascension 4. And he's kind of playing scales Lanka. Like, I've got... Productivity 3, Growth 3, Zero Magic, I do have Misfortune and Turmoil 3, which is unfortunate. And I got these paths that don't actually contribute to my Bless at all, which is to be avoided, I would say. But he is immortal. Withering Weapons, Unholy Weapons isn't a terrible Bless, it's merely a, a suboptimal one, shall we say. He's got a lot of research points, so when he wakes up, I'll have that going for me. And of course, he's immortal. That's nice. Um, not having any Fire Resistance will be a problem for me. Uh, I do have some water, so I can I can do some stuff with that. But overall, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Um, this doesn't really give me either of the things that Lanka wants. It doesn't give me a huge bless for my sacreds, and it doesn't give me really stellar expansion. So it's okay, and if I get to the late game, I think it'll be very, very functional. Just kind of have to get through the early game um, with this, which Lanka sometimes struggles with because their troops besides the sacreds are not fantastic. But in any case... Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.